All right, sorry for the late start. Um, so you should have available to you in your Blackboard shell now uh, comp1073, 18 winter, client side scripting. Okay, so just navigate to your Blackboard shell, make sure that you've got access to that. If you're enrolled in the course and you don't have access to this, let me know and I'll <coughs> send you the uh, I'll send you the code for today's today's lesson. Um, and let me know because sometimes it happens; it's rare, but sometimes uh, we do have a disconnect between Blackboard and Banner. So <coughs> let's take a look at uh, we're going to head over to course information and take a look at the syllabus. Um, so this is client side. It used to be called client. Well, it's it's all called client side scripting. We're uh, changing the name to client side JavaScript to be a bit more specific. Um, so um, the idea here is we're going to focus on the third layer. So in the fundamentals class, we focused on the markup layer HTML. We focused on CSS. We did an introductory lesson on how do we bolt JavaScript onto an HTML template, right? So um, we got we got kind of got the ball rolling. Now we're going to delve into okay, how do we, how does this layer work in terms of the third layer of the front end to provide an immersive experience? To how can we change the uh, user interface? How can we make create dynamic content that responds to user input? Right. So how do we uh, in in the clients on the client's device? How do we provide interaction and uh, um, and do all kinds of interesting things to some extent without the necessity of engaging the server at all. We can engage the server, but we don't even need to. And, and uh, uh, so this is um, so. Bear with me a little bit here. Um, uh, you know, if I if I if I trip up or I steer you wrong, um, uh, this is my first kind of kick in the can delivering this course. So I'm I'm really excited to be doing it. I've been kind of looking forward to it. I think I think why I'm excited to to teach this is because um, because in the past, for, for years and years, I, I mean, different browsers have kind of implemented different kind of flavors, if you will, of JavaScript. Like Microsoft had JScript, and and the JavaScript implementation on on say Mozilla powered browsers was was its own thing. And there wasn't there wasn't really kind of a standard way of doing things without the help of a JavaScript library. So you might have heard of jQuery, and we'll we'll, we'll you'll be doing a little bit of jQuery work. Um, you know, in this program, but jQuery, in not so many ways, is a bridge technology. It's kind of like Flash, right? If you uh, if you've heard of, of Flash, Flash was a plugin that we used to extend the browser when we couldn't do things like vector-based animation and multimedia embedding multimedia in the, in the page. The browsers just wouldn't were capable, so we extended the with the with a proprietary plugin, but it was kind of like adding oil to water. It wasn't we, we kind of in, the HTML became a place or a, a container for some other technology. Um, jQuery is not so much that way, but the, the jQuery and, and libraries like it. Um, the idea was, well, JavaScript can't quite do what we need it to do uh, across all these different browsing platforms. So we have to kind of create a library that kind of creates this common ground, and then we have to write this special version of JavaScript, right? Um, so what I'm going to take you, what we're going to do now, and this is perhaps one of the first times we've done this in the program, um, is we're going to stick with plain JavaScript. We're going to stick with standards-based JavaScript. And the cool thing about that is the time is right now. Because modern browsers, and I mean the ones you've got in your pocket on your phone, the one on your on your notebook, uh, the one on your, you know, on your game console at home on your smart television, modern browsers, you can write one piece of JavaScript code if you know what you're doing. And it works everywhere. And that's awesome. Like that to me, 
That's the spirit of the web. That's what makes, that's for me, that's why I love web technology so much. When you can build one piece of code and it works everywhere, it's ubiquitous. That to me is what's exciting, right? And JavaScript is just, some would argue it's, it's, it's there. And, and I would say, yeah, it's, it, we're pretty darn close. So, uh, so I'm really super excited to uh, uh, be kind of delivering this course and, and looking at how can we write standards-based code and write one piece of code and be 99% sure without a whole lot of extra effort that it's going to work everywhere, right? That's, so that's super cool. Um, also, JavaScript's just fun. You know, it's just, it's really, it's really neat because you don't need a lot and you can achieve a lot. All you really need is, is basically a, a notepad program and a browser. That's it. That's all you need. Your requirements are so lightweight. Right? And the things that you can achieve with this are pretty cool. So um, anyway, uh, client side JavaScript. Yeah. So the recommended book, uh, of course, will be uh, your textbook that you already have. So there's the, uh, uh, some content there on getting started with, with JavaScript. I'm going to be uh, posting different references. Um, uh, or references to different sources um, on the web, different kind of uh, articles and and uh, reference and references and guides and things like that as we go along. So, um, how are we going to? How am I going to get marks in this course? Okay, well, uh, this is what it's going to look like. We're going to have uh, we're going to have in class. We're going to have labs, uh, four assignments, uh, quizzes, and two tests. Right. So, um, yeah, hopefully that tallies up to 100 percent. My uh, math isn't. Terribly great. Looks good. I think so, right? Um, so what is the what is the roadmap for this? Uh, so what are we going to talk about uh, through this course? So so uh, we're going to build on some of those concepts and some of those ideas you uh, you talked about in uh, programming fundamentals, right? Um, you're going to see all of those structures here, right? But you're going to see them in uh, what we call vanilla JavaScript or standards-based JavaScript. Uh, we might even dabble a little bit, as we are today, into um, uh, ECMAScript, which is kind of a kind of a an attempt to codify what standardized JavaScript looks like, right? And uh, it, it offers us some other features that perhaps um, the uh, just the, the the ordinary JavaScript scripting language in the browser doesn't typically involve, but uh, it's pretty cool. So we're going to look at um, all of these structures, uh, so of course, variables, operators, strings, arrays, conditionals, loops, functions, uh, events, and then we have on week seven, our first test. Um, then we get into, we're going to get into objects, right? Which is, of course, what really makes programming powerful because then we can, uh, you know, define uh, an object and then reuse it, right? Uh, really leveraging that kind of dry. We're going to talk about uh, APIs both in the browser, so what can what kind of things can I access on the on the user's machine, right? In terms of like like geolocation and and uh, camera and different things like that. So what can I uh, I can uh, what can I access on the hardware itself? Yeah, what is the difference between the browser object model and the document object model? Why are those two things different? What's the, what's the deal with that? Um, then we're going to take a little bit of a look at APIs not running on 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 your machine but on the server. So uh, looking at other services that are running out there, how can I consume them and do really interesting things with JavaScript? And then what about multimedia? So how can I power other kinds of content like video and audio and, and, and things like that? Um, uh, maybe and maybe even get into maybe two D three D rendering. How can I how can I work with that kind of stuff using just the scripting language? And then we finish off our second test. So that's the grand master plan. I may I may alter this a little bit as we go along, being being um, being my first uh, kick at the can for this course. Um, but this is uh, it's pretty cool, and we've got um, we also have a, uh, a super instructor whose name's Albert Villaruz. Um, uh, he's going to be delivering the part two for this course, and uh, he is a massive programming talent. He is super cool. So hopefully I don't do him a disservice by hopefully I. Uh, uh, teach you, you know, teach you some good habits so that uh, so that he won't uh, 
he'll be he'll be pleased with uh, where we're at by the time we get into JavaScript uh, advanced client side scripting, or uh, which is the second part of this course. Cool. That's that. Um, and we'll head over to weekly learning. What module one? So this looks a little sparse. It will look sparse as I as I build this out and change things. And, um, uh, so uh, at any time, if uh, if um, if there's something you want us to delve into a little bit more deeply, if you're having any trouble with this, for sure, I'll I'll shortly be. I'm just configuring where, where my office hours are going to sit this term based on all the stuff I've got. Like I said. All the uh, side, of the de side of desk and regular projects. Um, but again, if there's, there's any ever, ever anything you need from from me, um, obviously come and knock on my door, send me a note, or um, we can also, for those of you who are more comfortable with uh, in programming, uh, you may want to uh, step up to be a peer tutor. So that's a great program, and we really appreciate when people uh, are willing to do that. We pay you, right? You won't retire early on it, but we, we pay you uh, then uh, to offer maybe. Uh, you know, a few hours, an hour once a week for um, four or five weeks to help your peers, uh, help your peers out. So don't hesitate to take advantage of that for sure. Okay, step. Let me know if you would, if you're interested in getting a peer tutor for yourself, or if you'd like to be one. Cool. Let's go to module one. <clears throat> And if we can pull down our lesson files, start dot zip. Extract those if you would. And for those on Windows, please get rid of the system directory underscore Mac OS 10. Thought I figured out a way to get rid of those. We're using the command terminal in Mac, but it turns out I didn't. So I'll have to figure out how to stop generating those things. Um, that's good. That's good. So get rid of the dump the zip in the trash. So you just got the lesson file start folder. So in there you should have. I'm not sure why it doubles up, but it does. And you should have um, four files in there. So fire up a code editor of your choice. I'm cool with any code editor. And what we'll do is we're kind of we're going to kind of hop around a little bit um, uh, between browsers just to get a sense of the different uh, uh, the different developer tools that are offered on the different platforms. They're all a little bit different, but they're all uh, reasonably, uh, for the most part, equally capable. Um, I, I'm I tend to treat uh, Chrome as kind of my kind of go to for for dev tools uh, because I find it very very friendly, but. Um, um, Firefox, uh, also the, the developer tools there are, are outstanding. Um, so we'll, we're going to take a peek at that. We'll also we'll also take a look at uh, um, 
you know, the stock Internet Explorer that, uh, in this case, just rolls out, this deploys with Windows 7. Um, you know, I'll have you take a look, if you're running Windows 10, take a look at uh, Edge as well. Just, for, just to get a sense of what, because uh, sometimes you can't choose what tools you have to work with. Um, I'll just minimize that. Uh, that's fine. Let's see if I can get Chrome up and running. Okay, so fire up your uh, whatever code editor you wish. I'm going to use uh, Visual Studio Code. I like the cross-platform nature of this. Um, I'll open up a folder, which is my lesson file start folder. And in there, you should have four files, um, two CSS files and two index files. Two templates, uh, HTML templates. So they're going to spark up index.html. Is that big enough for the back? That's okay. Yeah. Cool. All right. <clears throat> So a couple things we're gonna we're gonna roll through. We're, we're gonna build two little uh, small little uh, programs. So the first one we're gonna do is just kind of kind of get your feet get you kind of reacquainted with JavaScript from from the fundamentals lesson. And so if if you weren't there, uh, if you if you weren't in class for the fundamentals lesson last term, where we just kind of talked a little bit about uh, bolting JavaScript onto HTML, I I strongly encourage you to go back and watch that episode from the. Um, from my screencast from COMP1002 and just even just run it in you know double speed if you want just to sit through it and, and, and kind of absorb that. Um, but anyway, we'll get you so we'll get you reacquainted once here with JavaScript, where it sits, how it works, why we put it there, all those good things. And then we're gonna then we're gonna build a, a game, right? Where, where we can build capture some of that user interaction and we're gonna uh, kind of uh, serve up a, a number guessing game, right? Which is which is which will be fun. So um, uh, and so this will, will, will begin to get a sense of some of the power and flexibility of, of this language. So first things first, um, with standards-based JavaScript, all of the stuff that you know about HTML and CSS is true. It, it continues to be true. And so, you know, before you even start building an interface that's powered by interaction, just like with CSS, you know how I give you the gears about uh, about not, you know invalid HTML. Same thing. If you have broken HTML and you're trying to manipulate that with JavaScript, you're going to have all kinds of fun with your JavaScript because it's trying to manipulate a broken piece of markup. If the structure is not right uh, with your HTML, scripting it's going to be a real headache, right? And it's you're going to get inconsistencies across browsers. It might work, it might not. So make sure always, always, always that we validate our HTML. And again, a lot of JavaScript problems are not JavaScript problems. They're markup problems, right? So let's fix the easy stuff. So let's go ahead and, and check this out. And let's, let's heave the old index template up there and check it out. Okay. If you 
finding the errors in that in this in this stuff here. Uh, that's because I haven't had my second cup of coffee. So user beware. All right. So that's good. I got that right. That everything's cool. So I've got um, you know the basic stuff. Your doc type. Uh, I did see a few people um, uh, um, last term submit code, although well intentioned and understandable, um, with comments before the doc type. Um, so I, I understand and I appreciate where they were coming from. They're like, you know, for example, someone might put in their their name and the class and the, the date they submitted the work or whatever. I, I totally get that. That it's, it seems logical. The problem with um, the problem with that from a CSS and a, and a JavaScript perspective is that those two layers are expecting the first thing to be a doc type. Also, if, if the browser encounters anything but a doc type first it may snap into quirks mode. And that's an older rendering mode whereby the CSS is, um, is uh, it's almost like it's like the, the late 90s. Right? It's, like, it's like trying to build a web app like 20 years ago. And it's kind of like uh, you get different kind of, different kind of uh, output on different browsers. So they're, they're all a little bit different. So you don't, wanna, you don't wanna throw back into quirks mode. Make sure this is the first item in your HTML period. Okay, if you want to put introductory comments, put them after the doc type. That's fine. Um, even better yet, put them inside the HTML node, the root node, because the comments are part of the HTML element, right? So I'd like to see the first two lines of your code, uh, those two things. You know, um, so define the base language of the page. Always character encoding. Always uh, title for your page. Uh, you know. Uh, do, just do a search for, you know, uh, untitled document on the web. You'll see like you'll get like millions of hits. You know, it's like what? Uh, you know, this is the this is the easy stuff, man. Like, just put a title in there, and uh, you know, the search search engines will reward you richly for a well crafted title. So don't forget that simple. Don't forget the basic stuff. Um, and then of course a link to our style sheets Ups anywhere you can. Uh, so same goes for. Um, same goes for, for JavaScript. I want to see your CSS. We may put inline or embedded CSS from time to time just to maybe demonstrate some things or for other purposes. But for the most part, as a general practice, move your CSS out. Separate the three things. I want, sep I want separate Java JavaScript, HTML, and CSS. I want them to be in separate files. Okay, that's the end goal. So start making a practice of getting your styles out of the style element in the head section and into a separate file if they're not already there. So very, I've got a simple page here, very simple page. I've got inside the body, I have a primary heading and a paragraph. That's it. No tricks, right? Um, the style sheet, also, there's no tricks, so pull up styles.css. Uh, I've got my character encoding for my CSS. I've just set the font size on the on the body or the HTML, the root node, to huge, sans serif. I've centered everything. Uh, I've put a um, and then I've styled an emphasis element inside the paragraph. Let's take a look at see this how it renders on the screen. Open this up, and we're going to open up index.html in the browser. So these, most of the styles you see are the styles for the, for the HTML, the root node. Uh, this emphasis element, I've just put a, a background color, a border, a border radius, um, and a border color on that, right? I've also changed it. This is not a hyperlink. I've changed the cursor property to pointer, right? And the reason I've done that is just to encourage interaction for usability. So people are like, oh, that's interesting. Oh, I can. It does something. Right now, it doesn't. But we want to, anytime you can, anytime you're encouraging someone to do something, perhaps with the pointer, um, in a desktop where, where they have a pointer, right? In a touch environment, it's different. Um, change change the cursor to, to, to help them along, right? Coach them along. So that's it. No, nothing really, there's nothing really crazy in here. So I have a valid piece of, and, and the other thing too is, um, it's probably not a bad idea and the CSS validate if you type in CSS validator into your 
uh, code. It's a little bit of a different uh, URL. Oh, they've changed it. It used to be the jigsaw, this old, the old jigsaw one. Okay, css-validator.org. There we go. That's a bit more friendly. Let's also make sure that our CSS is in good shape. The reason why that's important is because we may be manipulating the CSS properties um, with JavaScript. Right? So JavaScript can actually manipulate the visual and the structural uh, components of the page. Uh, that's really important. But if the CSS is broken, like your HTML is good but your CSS is broken, that could chuck a wobbly at you uh, when you're trying to, to script, change some aspects visually for the page. So let's uh, let's throw the uh, the old styles.css and let's see how my CSS skills go. Oh. Doesn't like my background color, light blue. It's probably a non-standard uh, keyword. Dark blue, doesn't like that. Border radius doesn't exist in CSS level 2.1. That's fair enough. So it's checking for CSS level 2.1. Um, border radius is a CSS3 property, so that's that's all right. So um, yeah, there we go. That that that's okay. Nothing. There's nothing here that's. Uh, although these are errors in the context of CSS level 2.1 and CSS level 3, we're okay. So other than that, we should be good. Back to code. Let's go back to index study. So I'll close this out here. So let's go to our index. Okay. So step one. Um, let's get a sense of here. I'll close this. Move this over here. View. Toggle word wrap. There we go. Um, what is JavaScript? And it's important also, um, a good way, if, you, if you're ever in the position, you probably will be, where you're going to be hiring uh, junior people in your role. Um, uh, a good, a kind of a good, uh, kind of a, a test for people is, uh, um, is to, uh, you know, if, if you're listening to someone talk about their, their front end web skills and they talk about Java, um, Java and JavaScript are completely different technologies. The only common thing between Java and JavaScript is that people who work with those technologies both drink a lot of coffee. That's it. Seriously, right? I'm like, wow. How come they have the? They sound like kind of like one would be kind of like the, baby, you know, the baby brother of the other one or whatever. But no, they're different languages, right? They're different. So, um, you know, if someone starts talking about their their Java in front end web development, you've got a, a clue that perhaps they don't know as much as they're telling, because um, those are they're, they're quite different. Java, it's interesting. JavaScript, um, so it's a, it's a, what's called an interpreted language, right? So it's it's not compiled uh, like C or C sharp, right? And the code is run in a linear fashion, and then something's output to you, right? Uh, you don't have to run it through a compiler. Uh, we can actually—it's um, interesting—in the advanced CSS class, we're actually compiling um, CSS now, which is kind of neat. Uh, so you can put in—it's uh, uh, a—it's a technology called SAS. There's also another one called VAS, and you can do some really cool things with CSS, and then you compile it to plain old. Uh, CSS and it saves you a lot of work. Um, so it's not to say we won't get to a point maybe sometime where where JavaScript is, is compiled. We're doing some something interesting like that it might happen. But right now we're using it as an interpreted language. Um, JavaScript can run on the server or in the client, and sometimes both. Right? If you've heard of Node.js, Node is where JavaScript is running on the server. That's really cool, and that's really exciting. I'm, I'm new to Node, um, and I'm, I'm excited to learn it and to start using that as a server-side technology, because that means that the learning you're doing in the browser right now, to some degree, is now transferable to the server. So instead of learning two completely different languages like PHP and, and JavaScript, there's going to be some similarity. You're going to see some syntactical uh, sameness across uh, server and client, right? So that's really, really uh, cool. So it can be run, we can run it on the server or a client. This particular class will focus on client side. So we're going to be focusing on what's going on in the browser. Um, what can it do? It can do, uh, this is just a short list of some of the things that it, that it can do. Uh, this, this list is expanding all the time. As browsers get more capable, um, you know, 
you know, you walk around with your phone. Your phone can uh, uh, has all kinds. It's got accelerometers on it. They have uh, you know uh, GPS. They have all kinds of cool stuff, and you have access to a lot of this. Right. The idea is um, that kind of line between like a web app and a native app that runs on your phone from the App Store or from Google Play is blurry, right? Because you can, with a little, with, with some JavaScript knowledge, we can begin to talk to the browser API and open up the hardware to ex access the hardware. So it's interesting. And a lot of, the, a lot of the, the apps that you download in the store are actually just web apps with a wrapper. <laughs> and, they just, and off, off you go, and there's all kinds of uh, kind of cool utilities that allow you to, do, to build this stuff, put it in a wrapper, and then just ship it off to the, to the store. And it, then it runs as a native app, but really under the hood, it's this stuff, right? So that's what's also really cool is we're now leaving the confines of the desktop browser, and we're heading out into wherever you want. This stuff's that's awesome. That's exciting to me. Um, so we can do this and much, much more. Um, so it's not just um, it's it's the access we have with JavaScript to something called. Uh, application programming interfaces or APIs and that allows us to uh, connect uh, with other services that, and, and uh, allows us to to leverage chunks of snippets of code and functionality that we don't have to build from scratch right and that's incredible and there's 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 basically two main categories of, of APIs one are the ones that exist in the browser that allow you to access the the the, the hardware and software on the end user's machine, and then there's the third-party APIs, which largely largely exist as cloud-based services, right? Twitter, uh, Google Maps, um, Spotify, uh, things like that. Where so a lot of these a lot of these cool services that you you think of, well, you know, they're usually the, the main part of these things are is a like an app or or it's a it's a website. Well, not really the real power behind all of these things. A lot of these applications, they build the API first, and then the the uh, the user interface comes second. It's that API that allows them to really build an awesome service because, and then other people can build stuff for it, right? And uh, that's why they become so so good. So, you know, so yeah, Spotify. If you, if any of you have Spotify accounts, you know, just type in Spotify API, and you'll see a whoa. There's all kinds of cool functionality that can be exposed. Um, if you have the knowledge to kind of talk to that API and, and send a request. So browser APIs and third party. Um, so the, the, the cool thing about a browser API is it allows us to update the document object model, right? So there's a DOM API. The other thing is um, we have things like uh, Canvas and WebGL uh, APIs, which allow us to do things like 2D and 3D graphics. Um, uh, you know, lo location APIs. If the users uh, uh, enable or, or confirms that you're allowed to access their their location, you can do great things with that. Uh, audio and video, right? All of this stuff. Now, it, we used to have to rely on things like Flash for all of this. We don't need the, the, the browser is just out of the box. Work. It's really neat. So, anyway, uh, so that's. Those are just that's just kind of scratching the surface of what uh, uh, what this stuff can do. Okay, so what we're going to do, uh, we'll give you a bit of a, a, a chance to go and get being an early day. We'll go and give you a chance to go and get your coffee. Um, we're gonna we're gonna talk about um, accessing the DOM with HTML. Uh, you know, storing, looking at variables. Um, you know, uh, click event, adding simple uh, click events to elements and manipulating that DOM, seeing that we can actually manipulate the HTML. And also watch it happen in our code and in the browser window, right? So um, let's we'll get our feet wet and kind of get reacquainted with dot with JavaScript when we come back. So go go find yourself a coffee, and uh, we'll be back in about ten. How's that? Okay. <clears throat> so let's. Uh, Let's start uh, bolting together a, a little simple piece of JavaScript. Now, I want you to notice that the um, uh, the entire page here, um, although we're embedding this in the right in the body, the script element that we're using um, 
is the last element before we close out the body of the page. Okay? The reason we do that is, uh, is twofold. Uh, one is because if we're, going to, if we're going to build any kind of functionality that manipulates the HTML, I need this, this structure to be parsed by the browser and resident in memory first. So I need the DOM to be ready. The document object model has to be present in the, in the browser for it to be manipulated. So if I put the script before this up here and try to execute that code, it can't act on anything because it, until it reads this markup, it doesn't exist. So that's one. The second reason is performance. Um, we don't want to hold up rendering of a visual interface before the browser starts to either pull in external JavaScript files or start interpreting the language, right? So that's the reason why, generally speaking, for performance, you're going to see script tags, whether they refer to external JavaScript, which we'll, we'll do shortly, or whether they, they have um, uh, embedded JavaScript in the, the body. This, these script tags should be just before you close out the body. Okay? As opposed to CSS, where I'd rather have the CSS styles, uh, have the browser read those first, and, that, and then present the markup. And then I have those visual style rules right there in my, in basically, the browser has them in hand. So CSS before the markup, JavaScript after. There's no reason why you can't put the script up here as long as you include a wait for the DOM to be ready uh, uh, component in your, so it's what we call a DOM ready. So you can put it, but we ultimately we have to make sure that the browser can get, get at that. Okay, so step one, we, we get a sense of now what JavaScript is all about. Let's move into step two, where I'd like to grab an, a part of the DOM, a part of the HTML, and store that, give it a handle so that I can talk about it, right? So we'll use a variable to do that. And so what this looks like, let's say, um, so we need to get the emphasis element. And that is this here inside the paragraph, okay? And in our code, or in our, that is this, um, uh, element that I've, I've got here in blue. So we want to nab that and give it a handle so I can talk about it in my code. So step two, we'll say var, and I'll just use the word element. You have to be careful. Um, this one's okay, um, but you, there are some keywords that are reserved in the JavaScript language, and you can't use them as variable name. Okay, so the var element is equal to... Um, now... Keep in mind also with uh, with um, when I'm scripting, you see how I have a space on either side of the equal sign? I'm not writing markup. I'm I'm programming. So I do see from time to time uh, people might have, they, they might put a space around like this. And I understand why people do that because we get into that habit with, with writing script. So it's, it's understandable. But the thing is, in markup, this whole structure, this this uh, attribute and this value needs to be treated as one string. So HTML is not programming. It's markup. It's data. Right? They're, they're quite different. <clears throat> so our, our um, so good syntax and good, good formatting is going to be different for JavaScript than it is going to be for CSS or for HTML. Um, so now we're going to say, okay, so we're going to talk to something called the DOM, the document object model. We access that by saying document, okay? So inside that document, we use dot syntax. So document dot, and then um, what I can do is, I, there's a number of different ways I can access the document object, access the DOM, the parts of the HTML. We're gonna use uh, something called a query selector. So it looks like this, query capital selector, and your, um, whatever code editor you're using probably will pull that up and say, hey, as, you know, code hinting will be like, hey, you mean this particular method of accessing? Yeah, that's cool, and you can hit enter. So, um, this was actually inspired to some degree by jQuery, right? One of the reasons why jQuery got very popular is because it leveraged people's existing knowledge of CSS to talk to the DOM, right? Instead of uh, using these kind of weird kind of constructs to walk through the different nodes and find what you need, just say, just use your CSS skills. 
So this is really super powerful. So I can say, so in here I use query selector. And then in uh, single quotes, just use a CSS selector, M. And that's it. Now this M element, since I've used this, I can use a CSS selector, and it's going to basically grab this. There's only one on the page. If there's more than one, I'll have an array, right? But if I have one, there's just so let's check this out. Um, uh, what we'll do is we'll say console dot log. So we'll output this to the console element. When we're done a line, we terminate the end of line with a semicolon. Uh, you can write JavaScript all in one line if you want. You don't have to break the new line for in terms of formatting. And if you if your JavaScript is linearized for rapid transfer over a network, you, you there's no reason why you can't do that. But to make it human readable, we want to format it on multiple lines. So this is your uh, the delimiter for the next line, okay, of, of code. So that's cool. Save this. Control S, Command S, whatever you want. Let's reload the page. Of course, nothing would happen. We've just so right click. Um, I want you for, for this part of it to be to access. Uh, use Google Chrome. Okay. So you uh, will use the inspect. Right click on the page and click inspect. And then we should have access to this is the uh, this is the elements. This is the uh, the DOM ins what we call the DOM inspector. So this it isn't really your code, but we can kind of crack this open here, and we can see the different parts of the DOM. Right, so this is the M that I'm looking for here. So there's the, the paragraph element. Uh, there's the um, a text node, and inside there, of course, there's the, the element the ML. So this is the DOM inspector. Here we have the styles inspector, so we can see what uh, from the, the, the base browser CSS the, the, uh, and what other ones are um, are in play here. Right, so for example. The users from styles.css2, these are the styles that are in play. And we can enable or disable these CSS styles as well, just for, for diagnostic purposes, which is kind of cool. Here's the box model. So depending on what element you're, you're talking about in here, this will give you a sense of uh, the element itself, padding, border, and margin, right? which is super cool. Um, Let's go ahead. We're going to go up here to the console. I think I've broken something already. That's cool. So we, um, the console, I've got a syntax error on index.html line 47. Okay. So head over here to 47. What did I break? Ah, I've got a, <coughs> I've left a, a brace in there by mistake. So delete that, and you can see this is nice. Probably your code editor will underline that or indicate it visually that that's a syntax problem, if you've got a good one. So clear out line, clear that out on line 30, 47. Refresh the page, and you should see um, console.log should spit out this emphasis element. I now have that in hand. I can refer to that now with the variable name element. So logging to the console is is, is very helpful. Um, I'll get rid of that. I don't need that anymore or I'll just delete the whole line. Cool. Now I have it. So I, anywhere I want to refer to that M element, I can just call it element, right? Maybe, I don't know, if you want it to be uh, more specific, you know, I could call it uh, EM, capital element. I suppose if I'm if I'm talk like if there's if I'm using other elements on the page, maybe I need to be more specific. But with this simple example, we'll just call that element for now. All right. So right now, um, although the CSS indicates seems to indicate that I could click on that because I changed the cursor value to pointer, it's just an M element. There's no inherent functionality in clicking on it. So I have to add an on click. Now there's a number of ways we can do this. Um, and you'll see this, right? You can put an, what's something inside here. I can actually go in here and say on 
on click equal, and then I can put in, uh, you know, uh, console.log clicked, clicked, or something like that. So I, I can inject that directly into the HTML um, at what is called inline JavaScript, right? And that's fine. So if I refresh that with my console open, when I click that, you can see that indeed that works. The problem here is, just like I've tried to uh, encourage you to move your styles out of the HTML, we're now mixing structure and logic, right? If, if you see, um, just like if you put the um, uh, inside, you can, you can also put uh, uh, CSS directly inside um, an, an HTML element. This is considered bad practice. We want to keep these three things separate. So that is a practice that I'd like to just continue wherever possible. <clears throat> we, now we know we can do it, and sometimes we just use it for quick and dirty kind of diagnostic type things. But by and large, I want you to leave your HTML free of CSS and, HTML, or, and, and JavaScript. Okay, so we'll add a, cl a click event listener remotely using our JS. So this is what it'll look like. We'll say uh, element, because I can first do that, and we can say add, oops, lowercase, add capital event, capital listener, listener. Let's spell that right. So <clears throat> there are two things when we add an event listener. We add the name of the event we want to bind to that element, right? In this case, I'm looking for, I'm waiting for a click event. And then comma, whoops. Then what am I going to do when that event gets clicked? Right? And this is called the callback, right? <coughs> uh, uh, the, so let's say, um, let's say we'll just do console.log em clicked. I'm not sure if I can do that with the, uh, I, won't, I won't put that in there, put that on the outside of it. So now, instead of putting it in the HTML, I'm from remote, I'm adding that click, and then I'm going to spit something out to the console. May or may not work. So if I want to clear the console out, you'll see there's a little kind of a, a slash and a circle thing. I can clean that out if I want. Click that again. No, that doesn't. I can't do a console.log from in there. Generally speaking, we do something in there, and that something is usually a reference to a function of some sort. Or I can put an anonymous function in there. Um, but what we'll do is we'll say, okay, on click, uh, let's do, let's call a function called update capital name. Step three, so that's cool. Save that. Now we'll, we're going to actually say, okay, in the event of a click on that element, we're going to do the following. So we'll say function update capital name. Put a pair of empty parentheses here. And that is in case we need to, we, we want to accept any arguments or parameters for that function, right? In this case, uh, not necessary, but <coughs> open up a set of curly braces and just before we start step five close out the curly brace and so you'll notice when I do that it depends on what code editor you're, you're, you're using but generally speaking uh, your code editor is going to have a feature called balance braces and what this means is you'll see how I've got the cursor adjacent to this brace here notice how it puts an outline around the corresponding opening brace. That's really helpful. That's a really good visual cue. Particularly when you start getting heavily nested functions, you're like, ah, I don't know what bracket this closes or what brace or parentheses or ah, you start losing it, right? Look for that feature. That's really going to help you navigate that code. 
So function update name, let's in here, um, so we'll save that. Inside the function, we'll simply do a console.log, make sure it's, it's working properly, console.log, um, and we'll say function update name call. Let's just see if when we add, we click on that EM element, we're actually calling this function. You, What's, uh, this is a, here's another gotcha too. When you reference a function from something like uh, an event listener, oftentimes you'll see when you're calling a function, we, we do this, right? Not the case. That will probably cause you problems. Just use the name of the, the name of the function in here. Save that, let's, let's check, check it out. Reflog the page. And you should get in your console update name call. If you click it more times, it will probably just put a number, a numerical badge beside that rather than pollute your console with all those duplicate messages. Okay, if there's, a, if there's an error in there, right? You know, say I, maybe, I, maybe I, uh, I put a lowercase n there, right? Uh, it will give you, it will tell you uh, what line the problem is at. Index.html line 39. And there it is, right? I would encourage you to use camel case. Um, you don't have to, but I think it's fairly friendly. All right, so that's cool. We can get rid of this. Um, display a prompt asking for input and assign the input to a variable. So now what I want to do is I want to prompt, if you click the M, I want to prompt the user and say, hey, what's your name? I want to capture, I want them to type a new name and update that M with your name in this case, right? So here's what we'll do. We're going to say, um, we're going to create a variable name, var uh, first capital name is equal to and then we'll use the prompt method. And we'll say, please type your first name. So this prompt will, will stop all of the activity on the page and it will provide them with an input box um, asking for uh, some sort of input. And when they submit that, the this will return whatever they typed and assign it to this variable name. Okay. Refresh the page, click that, and you should get a prompt. This prompt may look different in different browsers. Right? I'll show you that this in a second. Scott. Okay. I guess Scott's not a good example because it already says Scott here. Okay. So now we have the, um, we can also, we can log uh, console.log to see if this is working. We'll put first capital name. So let's see if we can capture that in the variable name. And it should output to your console. So I can now refer to whatever they've typed in that prompt with that variable name. Cool. Now the last step is um, um, well not the last step. The last step in, in this uh, in the last step four. Step four we grab the input. So we want to grab now grab this and build a new string then change the text element inside the M. So I'm going to use this, whatever they typed with the variable first name, and I'm going to change the text node of this element and rewrite it. Okay? So let's go back here and we're going to say, all right, I'll get rid of the console.log. See you later. I'll say, <clears throat> so we'll say element, which is the EM element, dot, 
and we'll say text capital content. So that, that property of that element object, which is the M element, we refer to the dot text content, that's the text node inside, whatever that text is, we will set this to equal to, we'll do a couple things. Instead of it, right now it says teacher Scott, I'll change this to student and whatever name the person wants to type in. So we'll say, uh, so first thing is we'll add a string, student, space, and then we'll use a, an operator. When we're dealing with strings, that, unless we're using a math object, if we're using uh, strings of text, that is the concatenator. So concatenation may, basically means take this string and this string, glue them together, and we have one string. Okay? In PHP, the concatenator is a dot. That's a comparison. In JavaScript, it's the plus. So I want to glue together student space plus whatever they typed into the prompt. We don't need to output anything to the console because that, when we reload the page, should update that element. So now I want to uh, I want to make this unobtrusive, and by unobtrusive I mean I want to get the right now the JavaScript is actually part of the HTML. It's in the HTML document, right? It's it's kind of obtrusive. If I wanted to make it more ob or uh, more obtrusive, um, what I'm gonna what I would do is I would put that instead of using um, putting this uh, event listener using this remotely. What I'm going to do is I'm going to um, comment this line 39 out. I'm going to add this event listener, the on click to update name. I'm going to put that directly into my HTML. So I can say on click equal update name. This is called obtrusive JavaScript. This is bad practice nowadays. Right? I can reload the page. Oh, it doesn't work. I think I have to. I don't even know. Remember how to? I think we have to pass it in like so with the function. Reload. Here we go. Um, so we say, you know. So, Scott, isn't oh, yes, I can. Uh, so this is considered bad practice. Although it works just because something works, doesn't mean it's a good idea. You're going to see this all the time. You're going to see production code. You're going to be go. You're going to go out there. You're going to work on an app and go. Why is there all this JavaScript in there? Sometimes it's just you know, a lack of training, a lack of awareness, right? We're teaching you guys here to build things that are awesome. We're not, you know, you're going to see a lot of mediocre kind of stuff. And a lot of times it's just, uh, you know, you might be dealing with, with, with capable, otherwise capable programmers, but they kind of, they just treat web stuff as kind of a, a sideshow or a toy, right? Like, ah, as long as it works, it's good. That's just web output, right? The web is no longer a toy. The web powers modern business now, right? So we need to use, um, uh, now, we need to use good, pra good programming practices, and I want you to think like a programmer with web stuff. This is, this is an application you're building. It's not a web page. It's not brochureware. Those days are long gone. So you'll see a lot of this stuff, and part of your work will be to clean this up and make it better, right? Um, so I, I, I hope you feel compelled to do so. So um, we'll put this back in. So let's let's not put our JavaScript directly into our HTML. I want you to uh, now focus on 
making not obtrusive scripting, but unobtrusive. So separate those the the presentation, the logic, and the and the uh, and the, the structure, which is your HTML. Separate those three things. Um, so how we do that is we move this script into an external file and reference it with an empty script element just before we close out the body. Okay. So very often you're going to see uh, so this script element here contains our entire script. So what I'll do is I'll find this where we start the script element here, put the cursor just under the script tag on line 12, hold down your shift key, and then uh, hit the down arrow while you're holding the shift key and copy these lines. And I want you to go all the way down to just before we close the script. Cut that right out of your code. So you have an empty script tag like that. Okay. We'll create a new file. Paste the code in there. Now, of course, the, cor the code formatting, there'll be no code coloring right now. The, the, the document doesn't understand that this is MIME type JavaScript. It's just a text file. So we go ahead here. Um, uh, you can select all of this. You can go uh, select with a control or command A to select all. And if you hit the shift key and hit tab, you can tab this back to the left margin. Okay. So, because we, we're not tabbing that in from, we, we can get rid of some of that HTML formatting. And let's uh, save as, file save as. And we'll call this uh, element.js. And put this right beside, <coughs> inside the lesson start file, like so. As soon as you do that, of course, the code coloring comes back. You're good. Now head back to our template. The JavaScript is gone. We're going to use this empty script element, and we're going to say script src equal to element.js. So this path has to be correct. Very often you're going to separate all of your JavaScript and put it in a JavaScript folder, or a JS folder, or a scripts folder, or whatever. However the app structure is very often we're putting everything just kind of right here in the same kind of in a bit one big grab bag just for simplicity's sake. But there you go. Now, if uh, now what we do is, generally speaking, get rid of the um, the space or any empty line numbers uh, for your script element, like so. If you are if you're using a script element to ex to reference an external script, you can't put any JavaScript in here. You can't put anything, if you're using the source attribute and you're pointing to an external script, this, any code in here, will not run. So if you're thinking of being smart, like I was once, and oh, I'll kill two birds with one stone, I'll save a little markup, I'll reference my external script library and put my script in here. It won't work. This is, this is already used. If that's the case, if you want to also put in some more script, uh, you have to build a new script element. This is, if you're using this to, to reference an external script, that's all you can do with it. That's it. Now the other thing that, um, with HTML5 now, uh, just like we, we used to say um, in XHTML and older, we used to say uh, add the type element to our CSS, so this would be text slash CSS. Um, so we used to have to do this with our CSS in XHTML because it's a different MIME type, right? MIME stands for uh, multi multi-part internet mail extensions, MIME. And that was a technology we used when we first learned how to attach things, files of different types to emails. And so we used to have to define, say, this is not, this style sheet is of type text slash CSS. We don't need to do that anymore with CSS. And we don't need to do that anymore oops, with uh, JavaScript. So if there's nothing wrong with putting the MIME type in here for your JavaScript. Um, it's not wrong, but you don't need it because uh, 
JavaScript has kind of emerged as the de facto standard for scripts in the browser. So the browser is like, yeah, I get it, it's JavaScript. So I don't, don't need that. So save this. Let's see if we can get that, uh, reload the page. And if everything's cool, you should be good. Okay. So the main takeaways here are build JavaScript unobtrusively, right? Uh, it can, we can put it, we can also, uh, we can put it up here if we want. There's no reason why we can't. Okay. But watch. Let's see if this, uh, those problems. This isn't going to work because what happens is uh, uh, we're trying to bind an event listener up here. So this script is running, right? It, it's uh, um, so we're we are right here at line seven. This uh, em element does not exist yet. So the JavaScript is running and it is trying to find in the document, um, an M element. It cannot. The document, the DOM is not formed and it's not resident in memory. Right? So, um, that's why that fails out. Now, if in here, and we did this in, uh, in uh, our first kick at the can of JavaScript, if in this script we say we put all of our code inside something called a, um, a DOM ready function. So we, we could say in our code, wait till the DOMs fully resident, fully formed. And then it'll sit there, and then you'll form the DOM, and then it'll execute when that event fires. We can do that, but then if you have a huge amount of JavaScript, you're now introducing perhaps a bit of a performance issue. So the page isn't going to render. They're not going to get an interface before that all that JavaScript comes in, right? So for that reason, this is now considered best practice. Put your style sheet or, or an external reference to your styles out here um, and inside your uh, for external JavaScript reference that as well as other JavaScript libraries just before you close out the body. All right. So with that, kind of with that kind of high level appreciation of how it bolts on and where it lives and why we do that, now we can really do some crazy stuff with JavaScript. So. Um, Close out this here. Oh, actually, before we before we leave this little exercise, let's go over into another browser here. Let's uh, fire up um, fire up a copy of Firefox. Control or Command open. Let's open up Index, and I can right click on the space and inspect the element. Pull up the inspector. So, and you can change, of course, you can change, um, uh, I, I can dock this to the side, just like I might with the, uh, with the Chrome uh, console, you know, you can, so you can put that at the bottom or the side, that's cool. Um, there's our DOM inspector, it's not, it's not terribly different. It's really good, actually. The Mozilla, they, the, uh, the Mozilla team spends a great deal of time on, on this stuff, and they do a terrific job. Um, here's our, our CSS, our styles, and you can see here, I, this is kind of cool here, you can see the, uh, um, how the DOM, how we drill down into the DOM, which is cool. Um, uh, where did we stash? And we can go console. You see, I think it. Uh, oh, here it is. It's collapsed. File sheet editor, JavaScript debugger, web console. Right. So we can. Uh, and you see the the prompt looks quite different. Uh, so if I want to output some code here, see what that looks like. Uh, let's go to element.js.
save that, refresh the page. Right. So, um, pretty cool. All kinds of cool, cool tools. We'll try to take a look at, uh, this, this is, um, you might have Edge on your machine. Uh, let's go control open, let's browse and see what F12 pulls up. <coughs> so, <coughs> You can see the security controls on this allow prompts the user to allow the blocked content. It's hit F12 for your developer tools. And there's your DOM inspector. There's your visual styles. So I can drill down. Ay, ay, ay. Uh, drill down and find the M element right here. Right, same thing. And if we go to our console, there we go. Okay. All right, there we go. That's done. So next thing, we're off to build a game. Let's have a bit more fun. So close out this, close out this, and open up guest.html. Um, so again, doc types are first. Uh, the first thing on the menu here are we have the head section with a title. I'm referencing the external CSS, it's like same thing. My character encoding is in place. Um, I still don't trust that Scott gave me this HTML. Right? I'm not sure about this guy. So what do I do? Check it. Oh, so a warning is is not an error in the sense that it won't cause you problems, but what they're saying is that anytime you have a section element, you should probably consider adding a heading because you're breaking that content into a section for a reason. So maybe you should put a subheading or a sub subheading in H2 or in H3 or lower. But a warning isn't a broken DOM, right? Just so long as you know that. So we're going to proceed anyway. Yeah, I didn't put a section in there. I feel shame. Bad me. But I'm cool with that. I'll let it go. So, um, so than that, so we have a we hit, uh, word wrap. So we have a primary heading, number guessing game, paragraph. Uh, then we have a some form controls. So even though I'm not using a form element, I'm still using a label, right? And I'm still using the for attribute to associate this label with this input where they can type. So the for is, is, matches the ID for the input. So I'm still using that. Um, and I'm using a button. Um, notice I haven't put button type equals submit. If I do that, this is going to break my page because it will try and submit via HTTP or it will refresh the page. And I'll, I'll lose all of my data. So I'm not going to put button type equals submit, just a button. Okay. And then here we have a section element with three paragraphs which I'm going to use to contain feedback for the user. So this paragraph here will list the, the number uh, each of the guesses that the, the, the user has made. So that's helpful if you're doing a guessing game and you get five tries. You want to see what you guess. You want to see a record of what you've already picked. So you can say, oh, that's that was too high. Oh, that was too low. And narrow it down. So we'll output which what numbers the person guessed in here. This here will be the um, last result. So did was their guess high? Or was it, was it right or was it wrong? And then here, we're going to indicate, was the guess, we'll output some output here to indicate it was too high or it was too low. Okay, so that's, 
This is basically just user feedback in this, this section here. And then we have the script at the tail end of the page just before we close out the body. So we'll build it right inside the HTML. Uh, so I have access to the HTML right at my fingertips. And then when I'm done, I'll extract that and put it in a separate piece of JavaScript. Okay? That is cool. So we're ready to build the game. This is what time is it now? 9:39. Why don't I give you why don't I give you a five minute break? Um, uh, we're probably going to be done a little bit early today, which is okay. Um, so why don't I give you about a five minute break just to go and check your messages, stretch, and things like that, and then we'll come back and we'll build out this game, and <clears throat> I'll send you on your way. It'll be fun. Okay. Let's take a quick breather. Build the guessing game. Um, I would zip it up either way. I, I, Blackboard doesn't play nice with just raw HTML. I think it, it, it chokes and it's kind of like you're trying to, this is some sort of attack. Okay, so yeah, because I submitted just the HTML. I see like this little box popped up with my solution like in each Blackboard. So. Yeah, that's, yeah, maybe they fixed that. So maybe they, they, uh, they, they put a new like a file viewer inside it. So maybe yeah, it's what a, it was. Yeah, oh, I haven't yeah. seen that yet. If that works okay, that's fine. Yeah, um, but it used to choke on HTML. Like if you'd send up a plain old HTML, it'd be like security problem, and it would like it, it would be all bad. Bad things would happen. Blackboard's alright. It's a bit of a beast. Uh, for the other file, for index, this one here. Oh, um, this one. Yours not working? Yeah. 
Because you don't get the prompt? So go and take a look at your code. It could be that you've got a spelling mistake maybe here. Okay, so it worked when it was all on the on the one page, and now it's broken. Yeah, let's go take a look and see if uh, look at the JavaScript console. See what kind of errors are there. Yeah, you're right. That's really really. So what 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 All right, so let's uh, let's build a game. All right, so we should have guest.html up in up in front of us here. So find your way down to the script section. So when you're building a any kind of piece of software or planning out any interaction, it's um, you're going to get a sense of you're going to have in your mind's eye obviously what you want to build, but um, very often there's going to be other people involved in the process. So the idea really, you want to capture and be able to describe in plain words uh, what it is the thing is to do. And so it's, um, you know, and you can all you can always see great, you know, separate uh, good coding from great program. Great programming, you can read the code, and the code describes in very clear, simple terms what each part of the program does. Right? So it's almost as if you could remove the code and read just the comments and understand the program itself without actually seeing it. Right? That's called pseudocode. And, and so pseudocoding out your what you want to do in what order, uh, by and large, can help you. It's kind of like that rough planning process. Right? It, can, it can help you with that thinking. And it's much easier to do that thinking in comments than it is to start 
building code and troubleshooting code, but perhaps you haven't got things in the right order or you haven't included the right components uh, to do the job. So a couple things what we're going to do is we're going to, uh, uh, first of all, um, we're going to pick a random number from 0 to 100, right? And they're going to have the end user with a form guess that number. We'll give them 10 tries, right? If they guess the number, we'll say terrific, you, you, you've, um, you've, uh, you've guessed the number correctly, and we'll disable the guessing field and give them a button that allows them to play the game again. If they run out of guesses, so if they pick, they, they get to the point where they guess 10 times, we'll say sorry, game over, you didn't guess the number, we'll disable the form field, and we'll, we'll put a button out there allowing them to try again. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. And so what I've done here is kind of um, spelled this out in a number of steps, right? Um, and, you know, scanning these steps, you're like, wow, that's a lot, really. But we'll go through each little piece, and you'll see how, um, how uh, each little bit uh, does its job, and it's actually, uh, uh, there's actually almost more comment here than there will be code. So the first thing, before we start any kind of piece or interaction or a game or a component, there are a number of variables that we want to capture and we want to store things, which kind of saves, saves the state of the game, for, for example, right? Um, so first of all, we want to create a random number. We need that for them to guess again. So let's, uh, step 1A, let's create a variable for the random number, var ran random capital number. And we'll use some built-in functionality with, with JavaScript to pick a number, an integer, between 1 and 100. Okay, So here we'll use this and we're going to use the math object, math.floor. So what the math uh, math.floor, what it does is it, if you have a floating point number, so it's you know, 5.65, it will basically round it down. So if there's any, any, uh, it'll round it down to, so if, you know, if you're, if 7.2, it'll be 7. If it's 9.9, it'll be 9. So it won't, it won't round up at the 0.5. It goes down to the, the lowest number. Um, so what we'll do, we're going to get the floor, or the integer really, in effect, of, and we'll use the math object again, math.random. And math.random, random is a function, so we'll add uh, the empty parentheses. We'll multiply this because math.random, what that, that does is it picks a number from uh, 0 to 1 exclusive of 1. Right? So it's going to, um, so in effect, we're not going to get, the, the program won't be able to pick 100 as the number, for example. Um, and it will only pick a number between 0 and 1. So we, in order to get into the, from 0 to, uh, to 99, in effect, we need to multiply that by 100. That will give us an integer between 0 and 99. But I don't want 0. I want to pick it between 1 and 100. So what I'll do is whatever they pick, just add 1. Save that out. Uh, let's open up this game here in our browser. Cancel it here. Uh, use Chrome. We'll put guess.html. And our console, we can put in uh, random, whoops, random. So go ahead in your console and type random capital number. Right. In this case it's 7. When I refresh the page, you should get a different number. Good. Now we need to create 
Um, so now I can talk about the random number for this game just using the variable name random number. The next part is I need to create variable names. Yep. Uh, okay. That's good. That's uh, breaking things is good. So take a look at line 28. There may be. Um, is it referring? Is it, is it giving you a line number for the error? So now we need three variables because I'm going to need to, as the game progresses, I'm going to need to update the text content so I can update each of those guesses as they go along. I'm going to tell, have to tell them if they were low, you know, if, if they were successful or unsuccessful, and I'm going to need to tell them if their last guess was too high or too low. So I need some sort of way to reference these three paragraph elements independently. So we can use our query, our query selector for that. So let's say uh, for the first one, which is the list of guesses, we'll use var guesses, that's cool, is equal to, now we're going to uh, talk to the document object model. So I can use this ID as something to, to grab. So I can say this, I can say uh, document, use the, docu uh, the DOM API, document dot, and I can do two things. I can use a, a query selector, or I can say get capital element, capital by, capital I, lowercase d. And then in here, I can say guesses. So match this exactly, the ID of the element in here. So that's the first one. The next one is the, the next paragraph is the last ID with the last result. Var last capital result equal. And I can do the same thing. I can use get element by ID. Same result. Or I can use document doc document dot uh, query selector. And inside here, I can use a CSS selector. In this case, it would be ID last result. So both line 30 and 31, they'll both do the same thing in this sense, in this instance, right? My preference is to begin to use this a little bit more because this leverages our knowledge of CSS. And I can put and remember all of those, those crazy CSS selections we worked at yesterday? You can put them all in here. Attribute selectors, not negation selectors, pseudo elements, pseudo anything. Hammer it in there. You're just using your CSS, which is cool, right? That's why jQuery got so popular, because jQuery, actually they kind of pioneered that and said, well, we could kind of walk through the DOM and 
you know, grab this node and that node and this child and next child and all this kind of crazy stuff. Or we can just use the CSS, right? That engine's already kind of there. Let's access that. And, and that's why uh, jQuery is so popular. Well, it's one of the reasons. It's, it's a good library, but, okay? So that's great. Now we just need this lower high paragraph. Hashtag meaning ID, low capital or capital HI. Okay. So just to make sure we got those, um, we'll save that. Did I mess? Oh, I messed that up. <laughs> Thank you. Now that wouldn't have worked. No, I wasn't meaning to do that at all. All right, so um, let's reload the page. If there's any errors, they'll report in the console. Right, track them down. Um, let's see if I can get, let's see, low or, what is the low or high variable? So type the name of the variable, hit enter, and it should nab that paragraph. Of course, that paragraph doesn't have any text in it. So when I mouse over it, it's there on the screen. There's just no content in it. No. So it's not accessing that. Um, uh, uh, it's not accessing that element. So let's just say I, I put, let's just say I put a typo in here, for example, right? So that's there is obviously no element with the ID low o high. I'll try and recreate that a similar error. That's a good one. So here we go. I'll re refresh that, and then I'll say, what is the low or high variable? No, right? Because it, it can't find it, that that selector is is not finding anything, right? So it in a sense, your JavaScript isn't wrong. There's no syntax error in this case. It just can't get the element. So make sure, like, make sure you're able to grab that. Cool. Now we need some variables so we can talk to these parts of the form, right? There's a label here for uh, entering a guess. There's an input element for typing the, the number. Notice I've used the type equal number, right? That doesn't prevent someone, if this was a more sophisticated, uh, that doesn't prevent someone from typing a, oh yes it does, in this, in this case it does. That's kind of cool. May not have never but anyway, so, but it gives you the little uh, incrementers and decrementers in there, right? So that's cool. Um, so I need a, I need to be able to talk to this label, talk to this um, this here, and talk to this button, so I can disable these when the game is over, or when when uh, when they're out of guesses, or when they when they were successful. Like I don't want them to be guessing once the game is over. So I need to be able to talk to those elements as well. So let's so we have an um, a label and an input. Let's go here. So we'll say var um, guess capital field equal document dot uh, let's use the query selector query selector <clears throat> And what I'll do is I'll, I'll use input with the ID. And what is the ID for that input there? Uh, guess field here, ID guess field. So input ID guess capital field. Watch your I before E, except after C. That? I never got that right. I was messing. Always. Uh, OK. That's good. So now we've got that. Now we can now we can just refer to the guest field, like that way. Um, 
We need to also refer to the submit button. Var, uh, and we'll call this guess submit. Selector. And again, we'll use CSS. The submit button is just a button, but I want to be a bit more specific about that uh, if I can. Um, no, I don't need to be, right? Only is only is uh, only as complicated as you need to make it. No more complicated. So we'll just use a simple selector button. Sorry? If you had more than one button, you could just go to your... Yes. So if you had more than one button, this would re this would contain an array, right, with a, a, a whole bunch of them, however many you are. So it, 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 it very much depends on your app, right, what you're building. Cool. All right, so step 1D, we need to create variables now to initialize the counter for the number of guesses. So we need to start um, uh, to start counting and track how many guesses the user has made. Because once they hit 10, they're done. They're, they're out of here, right? So let's say var, and we'll call it the guess capital count is equal to, let's start with one. So they are at guess one to start with, to start the game, okay? Now, we don't have a reset button. Right? While they're playing the game, they don't have a button that says play the game again because they're currently playing the game. So, but I do need to, I'm going to create that button on the fly and then output it on the screen. So I do need some kind of quick and easy way to refer to that button even though it's not part of the document object model as of yet. So we'll initialize that right now. We'll give this a var and we'll call it reset uh, button. I don't need to assign it any particular value or talk to any part of the DOM, right? I can just simply initialize that variable. So now it's waiting to be assigned to something, to be assigned a value. Okay? That's just good practice. Like you know, while you're when you're setting things up, you know, kind of getting tooled up for, for lack of a better word, you want to maybe declare all those variables that you're going to be using in as uh, kind of a, a nice neat kind of area. Uh, for uh, for you to refer to. All right, so that's it. All our variables are set up. Now we start to do, let's do some usability. So when they first land on the form, right, if I reset the page, um, geez, wouldn't it be good if I could, for usability, put the cursor right there in the form so they don't have to go around and go, oh, well, um, I guess I have to click on this or, you know, click on the label or, hit the tab button or something. Let's 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 take away all of the thinking we can from the user. Let's us do the thinking and let's not make the user think when they don't have to. So let's add focus to that form right away. And this is cool. So what I can do is I can say I already know what that guest field is. Whoops. I can refer to it as that, right? So let's just make sure it works. Let's go into the console and see does guest field, guest capital F L D, yes, right? It's attached to that part of the DOM. So now what I can do is I can put focus on that field. Guest field, and now that you've initialized those variables, a lot of times your code editor well, when your code hinting will come up, oh, you've got a variable here, do you want to use that? Yeah, for sure, right? It kind of speeds things up. And I can say guest field dot focus. Super sweet. Reload the page. As soon as you do that, you should get, um, I'll zoom this up a bit. You should get focus right on the element. All right, we're coming along. We're coming along. All right, now we need to get into um, into the logic. 
for the program. So now we need to build a function that's going to check what the user typed and, and compare that to the random number, right? We've already generated a random number up here, so it's already sitting there in memory. We need to, uh, we're going to capture, we can capture what they're going to punch in here when they hit submit. So when they submit, I have to check it, right? I have to compare those two things. So let's build that function here. So step three. And we'll call this function, and we'll call it check guess. We'll put in the parameter, the uh, parentheses, in order to for the function to accept parameters. It, it doesn't necess, it doesn't necessarily need to accept parameters when we call it, but we'll put that in there. I'll open up the curly brace, and I'll head all the way down here. <clears throat> to the end of uh, step 3H. Let's make sure my, I tried to format these uh, comments so that we can, so just before step four, is that what I did? Yeah. Close out the function right there. So step three, is all, all about um, building out this check guess function, okay? So the person's going to uh, punch in something, just like we did with the, other, uh, with the pr other prompt, right? We have to capture that and assign it a variable name so I can refer to it, right? So again, here in step 3a, we'll create a var. And we'll call that guess, user guess user guess is going to be equal to and we'll use the javascript number object and we'll call a guess field which is the dom element right up here that's this here because we're already referring to that with a variable uh, guess field, right? That's the input element. And we want to grab not the input itself, but the dot value. So that's what they type into that field. And we don't want that to be stored as, um, uh, as a type string. We need that, we're using this number function to say, if you can, numbers can be treated as strings, right? But we want it to actually be a, a numerical value, so we convert that to the data type number. Now, I've, I've already, by, by putting this, by changing this to, um, to the type equal number, I've certainly helped things along, right? I've avoided the whole hassle of allowing them to put a, a, a letter in there, but uh, we still want to make sure that's treated as a number. Cool. So let's, I don't know, let's, uh, we can, um, we can check this. Let's say console, well, I can't do that because we're not calling the function yet. No, we'll sit, we'll sit tight on that. User guess equal number of it. So we have the user's guess. So now step 3B, um, all right, I'm going to change the word wrap, word wrap, there we go. If this is the first guess, which in this case it is, we need to add some text to the screen as a label for listing those guesses. So as soon as you make a guess, I want to output that to the screen here in this paragraph. So as you guess, you can count how many times you've guessed and what those you can recollect what those guesses were. So I'm going to output that guess to this paragraph with the ID guesses. I already have that var equal guesses, so I can talk to that element. So here we go. So this is what this looks like. So we're going to say, we're going to create a conditional here. So we have to check and see, is this the first guess? So we use if, use a parentheses, and then we use guess capital count, which we have up here as one. So if guess count, and we have to say triple equal. That means, is it exactly and completely equal to one? If that is the case, open up the 
open up a brace, close a brace, that's cool. Then we're going to set the text content. Uh, guesses, guesses dot text content is equal to, and we can output a string, previous guesses, and a little bit of a space there. Just scooch ahead here to step 3i. Page 3i. Did I not? Where's my 3i? We're going to bind this function. We're going to create an event listener that calls the check guess function right away. So I'm going to go a little bit out of just so we can kind of see how we build it out. Um, I should probably put this in step 3a, but that's all right. So go, go down to step 3i um, right just before we close out the script. And we're going to add an event listener to the submit button, which we call guess capital submit dot. And we've done this before. We add event listener. And the event we're looking for is the click. And when they click it, I want to call this function that checks that guess. Okay. So so first is the, the event the, that, we're, that we're binding to this element, and then check capital guess. We don't need to put the we don't need to put the uh, um, parentheses after the function. Just refer to the function name. So that's cool. Uh, let's put some sort of check in here um, just before we check the guest count. Let's just console log and let's log out um, uh, function. Oops, I use hard bracket or hard quotes. Function check guest call. Let's just see if that works, right? One step at a time. We've built a function. It's not fully fleshed out yet, but we've built a, a, we've, we're going to make sure that that button has a, when it's clicked, calls this function. So let's see if that's the case. Save, reload the page. Don't even enter anything. Just hit submit guess, and we should have function check guess call. Yep. Do you want me to see the event, the, the click uh, at the no, bottom? I, I didn't get that part down. Okay, here's the event listener down here. Yeah, I've got that. You got that? That's okay. Yeah. Okay, so up here where the where we log out to the console here. Spell check guess wrong. Oh, I did. I did indeed. Just call me up. <laughs> you, you're, you're, you're catching me with uh, low caffeine levels. Yeah. yeah, taking advantage. I see. That's how it's going to be around here. Eh? <clears throat> All right. Yeah, it's uh, coding alone. I find coding a very social activity. I, I don't like coding by myself. I much prefer coding with other people because I break things all the time. And then I'll look at that code. You're going to find this again and again. You'll be like, my code is perfect. My code is perfect. I've spent three hours on this. It's perfect, right? And then you can look at it and look at it and look at it. And then somebody will be like, I oh, forgot a comma there. You'll be, and everything just works suddenly. You're like, 
why didn't I see that comment? It's just it's one of those weird things about code. Like you're so close to it, you're so working so hard on something, it's like you become blind to your own kind of uh, you know typos and things like that. It's really weird. Um, yeah, always if you can code, you know, treat it as a social exercise when you can. If you, if you can code, you know, um, with other people around, it's it's always great because I, I I find I I can't find my mistakes, right? Okay, so that's cool. We're calling the function. And the nice thing is, in this case, guess count does indeed equal to precisely and exactly one, because then uh, I've output here, and you can you can open up the elements here. Um, sorry? You don't need it, no. No, but you'll notice here that the I've also output uh, and you can see if you go to the elements, if you if you go away from the console here, you hit the elements here. You can see how now the JavaScript actually output this here, the text node in here. Previous guesses. We'll watch this in action. Watch. So refresh the page, right? Um, open up this section in the element. Here's the paragraph, or uh, yeah, here's the paragraph for the ID guesses, right? Submit a guess, and you see that. Little, you can see a little pink thing. So watch. Refresh the page. Open up the section. Open up the. I can't open it up right now because there's no text node inside. It's empty. But then hit submit. Watch this paragraph ID guesses when I hit submit. See that? It kind of it kind of glowed pink for a second. And if I crack open that node, there's the text node. So the JavaScript is actually manipulating the HTML. It's rewriting it in the browser. And it has nothing to do with the output from the server. Once you get the stuff from the server, you got it. Unless you're making asynchronous calls back to the server, which we will do, and getting more information. But right now, you've got, you've got what you've got from the server. This is all locally. All right, so that's cool. And this seems to output this label here. That's cool. Let's go to step 3C. Uh, I don't need this uh, extra space here. Add the user's current guess to that list. So whatever they typed, I want this to go here in that paragraph for their reference. Okay. So we'll then say guesses, guesses dot text capital content. Now we're going to use uh, instead of setting it, setting we're going to do something called uh, plus equal. So this is an interesting little operator. So what this does with these strings, since this is a string, a uh, string of characters, what this does is then add to, concatenate onto the end of this, whatever it is already, whatever we're going to put on there. Because I don't want to blow away previous guesses. I just want to add the number, whatever, take that text note and then bolt onto it. So this is like uh, plus equal add on to the end and what we want to add on onto the end here is the user guess user capital guess whatever they typed in there and then I'll concatenate oops or bolt on plus I'll put a space and the space is there for when they add another guess I want to have a space separated list Refresh the page. Of course, we need to um, go ahead and punch in a, a number between 1 and 100. Submit your guess. And it should output previous guesses and output what you typed in there. If it doesn't, pull up the handy dandy console, fire it up, and track down. It should tell you what error. Uh, where your problem is, what line number. <clears throat> cool. All right, so we've checked if the guess, if it is the first guess, then we need to output that label. That's cool. Now we need to check, um, uh, we need to put in a conditional check. Well, maybe they guessed the number. If they get it right, we want to do a number of things. We want to give them a success message and end the game, right? They're done. They're it's all done. So, um, so we create an if 
if the user guess what they typed in is equal to and exactly the number, which up here is, of course, random number. So if that's the case, random capital number, watch your camel case, that'll get you every time. If that's the case, open up a curly brace, uh, but we're going to put the end curly brace just down here. Okay, so this is a this is one possibility, right? So we have to capture this. If if this is actually uh, the very same number, then we need to output a success message. And call the game over. Okay. So we'll say output the success message. We'll say um, so we need to output the success message up here is here, the last result. So this is where we're going to tell them uh, if the guess was good, if it was bad, or if they got it right, right, or whatever. Um, so let's go down. Where am I here? Put a success message, then get. So if they got it right. We're going to put last capital result dot text capital content equals you guessed the number. Um, if they have a prior, if they have a prior guess that was low or high, this uh, we'll build this out later. This low or high paragraph might say your last guess was too high, or your last guess was too low. I need to clear that any content out of there. Not there might be no content, but I need to clear it out of there. So we want to set uh, low capital or capital high dot text capital content equal. Nothing. Clear it out. Zap it. And then we're going to end the game. Now, ending the game, there's a number of things that I want to do to end the game. So I'm going to build a function to keep all that neat and tied and all together. So I'm going to set set capital end capital game. There you go. So there's step 3D. Oh, I'll do a, uh, something else. I forgot to change the color. So I also want this paragraph that says, you guessed the number. I want to be that to output as green. So there's a very, so let's say, so we can mod, uh, modify the C CSS style. So we can say last uh, result dot style. So I can access the uh, CSS or the uh, rewrite these properties and I can set the background dash color so it's not quite as quite what CSS is background dash color in JavaScript it's background it's camel case background color and I'll set that equal to <coughs> and it's a string green save that up cool so we've captured if they get it right we give them a nice message in green. Uh, we clear out the any other if it, messaging about low or high guesses, and we call the set end game function. Cool. Another possibility is that the user is all out of guesses. They ran out of chances. They didn't get it. So we need to end the game, uh, but we need to tell them that they're all out of guesses as well. All right. So <clears throat> what we'll do is uh, we'll create a an else if. So we've got if here. That's the case. Now, if this is not true, we can say else 
if open up the braces now sometimes it's helpful for uh, just for styling is I could close this out here like this uh, and get rid of this so move this one down here right so then we can see this this conditional if else if else if else and this conditional right so we're checking for a number of situations so maybe grab the end of bracket for this if here, bolt it onto the front of this else if, open that up, and then we'll close out this one, this else if down here. So the user is all out of, uh, is all out of guesses. So let me say, okay, if, guess count is equal to an exactly 10, they're out of luck. So in this case, the last result, last result dot text content will not be a fun message like you guess the number. It will be equal to uh, you are all out of guesses. And set end. We'll use the set end game function, which we haven't yet built, but I'll call that as well. Because the same result, it's game over, whether they guessed it or they're out of guesses. Now, the other possibility um, is that uh, the number. They could still have guesses left, but they're wrong. Okay, so we'll close out the else if for the, um, uh, then there's, there, there are a lot of guesses, and we can say, okay, else, this is the last possibility, else, else, oops, where'd I go? So just before step 3G, we close out that entire if structure. Okay, so, so either they got the number right, we end the game, they're all out of guesses, we end the game, or we have to tell them whether it's high or low and allow them to guess again. Okay, so I'll put an appropriate message. Uh, last uh, result dot text capital text capital content is equal to wrong. Take that. Something like positive reinforcement. <laughs> All right. Also, let's uh, really hit them over the head with it. Let's set the background color to red. Last result dot style. And the style, uh, it, uh, the property we're looking for is background dash capital color, spelt American, is equal to string red instead of green. Oh. I had a typo up here. Lucky I caught that. All right. Cool. All right. So they're wrong. The message is going to be read. That's cool. But now we need to give them. We need to check and see if their user, the user guess, is higher than or lower than the number. So then we need an inside this we put another conditional if statement so first situation is the user guess is less than random number okay. if that's the case 
we need to let the user know. So we'll say <coughs> low or high, low or high, Oops. which is this paragraph up here, which is waiting for us to put some text content in here. Okay, we've already, we're already, we can already talk about that with this variable name because we've queried the DOM. It's the element with the ID low or high, so that's cool. So we just say low or high dot text content equal to low. Now, of course, <clears throat> else, else if the guess is too high, else if user guess is greater than random number, Actually, I'll move this. That's right. That's fine. Okay. And again, I can copy this lower high not line, speed things up a bit. You can just go like this. Copy that out. And watch your brackets. Right? Watch, this is where formatting is really important. You know, nest these structures. So this should be nested in here like that. So I can see, by looking at the left margin, I can see that if, else if structure. Save that. Okay, so we checked. We've, we've checked the three things uh, in our um, in our function check guess. Uh, we checked to see if uh, it's they got it right, um, or if they're out of guesses, or if they got it wrong. That's fine. So now, um, if they if they got it wrong, we're still in this function. We've left the function. Um, uh, with these two here by calling the end game function. So here we go. Uh, now we need to say, okay, they got it wrong. It's high or low. Now we need to increment their guess count. So we say guess capital count and we say plus plus, which means increment by one. We clear out the old guess. So we say guess uh, field dot value equal nothing, empty. And then we add guess field dot, uh, and then we add focus oops, to the guess field so that they can try again. Then we're finished. <laughs> Step 3H is proceed to the bottom of this file just before we close out the script. And that is, of course, uh, I where we add the event listener, which we've already done. I skipped ahead. So now we are effectively done the check guess function. So when they hit, and we've added an event listener to call check guess when they hit the submit button. So Effectively, we can try our program. It has some amount of functionality. So save that. Reload the page to reload that fresh JavaScript. 
Try it. 56. Too high. All right. Uh, 23. Too low. And now it's, as you can see here, we've got both of those guesses there. So now I know it's between 56 and 23. I don't know. 36? Too low. All right. 40, too low, okay, <clears throat> 48, too high, too high, too low, I'm narrowing down, let's go, come on, 43. So if you get to the point where you guess, you're able to guess the number or you run out of guesses, um, it will call set end game. But that should be an error because it's not defined yet. We might run out of time here. <laughs> That's all right. So now we need to build a function to end the game. So when we end the game, what I want to do is do a couple of things. I need to disable the guessing field in the submit button. So when we're finished, they can't be allowed to type anything in here or hit the button anymore. Shut that down, right? We don't want to do that. So that's the first thing. The next thing we need to do is then build a new button to start a new game. So I need to ha somehow have a button down here that says, try again, play again, right? Um, then I need to, uh, <clears throat> to add a click event to the new button that calls a reset game function, right? Then I have another function to start the new game. So then I need to restore the guest count variable to one because we're starting over again. Clear out all the old messages, right? Remove the new game button. Re-enable the guessing form because I just disabled it. Change the background color back to white because there's a green, there's a big green or a big red uh, error message, or and generate a new random number. So it seems like, man, this is a lot of stuff just to do for a simple guessing game. Yeah, there is, right? I mean, think about, think about trying to describe to someone on a piece of paper how to tie a shoelace, right? That'd be a pretty long series of instructions. Something we don't think about, right? Um, so anyway, uh, what have we got here? 1047, all right, we'll, we'll see how far we get. We'll finish this up uh, at the start of the next class if we, we don't quite get there. That's OK. Let's build the end game function first. Build the function end the game. So we're going to, what do we call this? Uh, set end game function set capital end capital game. We may pass it, uh, op leave a open parentheses there to pass it any parameters that it may need. And then close that out, close that function out just before you start <clears throat> step five. Grr, there we go. <clears throat> so we need to disable the guess field and the submit button. So guess field and use this text if the if the if the thing pulls up and says, Oh, do you mean this variable? Yeah, use it. Just hit the enter button. Guess field dot um, disabled equal true. So the disabled property of a DOM element that is a an, a form input control, we can have a disabled. Is it true or false? Right. We can control that, um, and that's the same as adding the disabled equal disabled attribute of value in the HTML, but we're doing it with uh, <clears throat> so we can also disable the guest submit button. Now they're shut down. Now we want to add a new element to start a new game. Okay, 
That's our new. So we're going to say, we'll call this uh, the reset button. Set capital button is equal to document dot create capital element. Yes, we can create new parts of the DOM. We'll create a new DOM element and we'll create a button element. But just because we create an element doesn't mean it's sitting there in the HTML. Right? Uh, let's add some text to that button. So we'll say reset capital button dot text content. is equal to uh, new game. Now just because we've created it, added a text node to it, it just sits there waiting. It's kind of like uh, just sitting there on the side. And we Now we have to inject it into the document object file. We have to take it and say put it, append it to the DOM. So how it looks like this. We say document document dot body dot append capital child. So we're taking the body element of the document and appending one more node. And that add append child uh, we're adding is the reset button. Adding a new node. It's called adding a new node to the DOM. Then we need to add a click handler to that crazy button. Reset capital button dot add event capital listener. And we're at a click handler, just like we've done. And when we do that, we'll, we're going to call the reset capital game function, which we have not built yet, which is step five. So that's the set end game function all done. And so, 10 to the hour. <sighs> Ran out of time. Oh, well, I'm sorry. We'll tidy, we'll finish this one uh, up next. We'll build the start new game function. So save, save all your files. That's it for this week. There's no text, there's no homework for this week. There's no lab today. Um, so you're, you're off the hook. But next week I'll have some stuff for you. Okay? Have a great day. Thanks for playing my game. I like it. I'll throw this, I'm going to throw this uh, up on the. Uh